Games, and welcome to the fifth part of my world building guide series for creating an Earth like fantasy world. This series is definitely uh, <laughs> something where you have to start from the beginning, so if you haven't watched those videos yet, I will link the beginning of the playlist. In the last part, air circulation and pressure zones, we mapped out our major wind belt, wind currents, and our high and low pressure zones. This video will sort of be like a part two to that because we're going to be working with the ocean circulation now. So we are going to start this with a bit of a lesson on ocean circulation. And this whole topic in general is incredibly complex and, you know, someone who truly understood it could probably take days explaining it to you. Now, I am a writer, not a physical oceanographer, so I am not that, you know, <laughs> qualified to be talking at that level. And there is also an extent of ocean circulation that really isn't going to play a part in the type of climate that we're mapping for our fantasy world, so we are not going to get into it, as much as that pains me to say. We will almost be exclusively focusing on surface water currents, which are going to be about the top 10% or so of oceans, I think. And we will dip slightly into the concepts of like diodes and upwelling because they are relevant even if not as much now, but they will be relevant later. The other thing to note is that a lot of the cycles in ocean circulation and the things affecting that are on multi-year cycles. So it's not really something that fits into our annual cycling that we're mapping right now. So any of the effects would be things that might impact every five years, every five to 10 years, or even larger than that. So it's just, it's really not something we can touch on, unfortunately. Now, it may seem a bit strange to think that something like ocean circulation can have such a big effect on climate and on people's lives, but it really does. These currents do a lot of things from moderating temperature to impacting sailing and trade to impacting fishing and where ice sheets can form. There are two main things that we are going to worry about for surface ocean currents, and this is wind and land. The major wind belts that we've already mapped out are going to carry and push or blow the uh, surface water currents along the same path as them, and they will keep moving in these directions until they hit, you guessed it, land. And at this point, they will split north and south, travel up the coast until they run into another major wind belt, which will carry them the other way, and then this cycle will repeat, and they will continue in these sort of large circular ocean currents that are called gyres. And if land masses don't break up these currents, they will just keep traveling around the globe. Another thing to note is the temperatures of these surface ocean currents. When they're traveling somewhere where the air is very warm, so think the ITCZ, the water will be heating up as it moves, and at the subpolar low belt, the water currents there will be cooling down. So when these currents then split off and go into, you know, warmer or colder areas, they will bring that sort of temperature with them a little bit. So with the equator, um, when you have these water currents that have been warming up a lot due to the warm air and the heat from the sun, they'll hit the coast and split north and south, but they will be bringing those warmer ocean currents to more colder areas, which will have a warming effect on the coastline. A random fun fact is that in areas where you have a lot of evaporation, think like the subtropic high, these waters will actually have a higher salinity level because so much of the water is evaporating and leaving a lot of that salt content behind. Very cool. All right, so let's move on to mapping ocean circulation. We are going to want two new maps with seasonal ocean circulation at the top, and we are definitely going to be referencing our seasonal air circulation maps, so make sure you have those handy. You're going to want three colors for this. Black for neutral, red for warmer waters, and blue for colder waters. And these are the steps we are going to go through on each of our two maps. We're going to start where your ITCZ blows over the ocean and draw a neutral arrow from left to right as your equatorial counter current. Immediately above and below this line, also in a neutral color, draw an arrow from right to left where the ITCZ blows the water to the west. Step two, where these currents hit the west coast of land masses, they will disperse. Draw red arrows for warmer waters traveling away from the equatorial currents and toward your westerly winds and subtropic high belt, around 30 degrees. These currents will be curved so that they will be headed towards the poles and the west while it is closest to the ITCZ, and then towards the poles and the east while they are closest to the subtropic high belt. Step three, 
Now use black to draw the currents dragged by the westerly winds around 30 degrees toward the east. Again, when they reach land, they will split. Use a red arrow to show current splitting to head toward the poles, following land masses and tending towards the east in a curve until they get closer to the subtropic low belt and then tending towards the west. Use a blue arrow to show current splitting from the subtropic belt and heading back towards the ITCZ. Step 4. Onto the subpolar belt. The currents here will be black and travel towards the west, only being redirected if stopped by a large landmass. Blue currents will head away from the poles and towards the subtropic belt. Step 5. All of the currents should create these gyres, alternating in directions. Fill in the rest of the currents anywhere the circles aren't closed. If any of your belts are not impeded by continents, the current will be stronger and impede the heat transfer. If this occurs at the ITCZ, change the color of this current wrapping around your globe red. If it is around your subpolar belt, mark it blue. And if any oceans are cut off from colder warm waters, this will affect the temperature of the waters. Try to account for this by changing the colors of some of your currents. Step six, select colors for warm ocean currents and cold ocean currents. I like to use a light blue and a red. With the blue, color just a little bit of the coasts of your land masses next to cold ocean currents. And with the red, color further inland on your coasts of your land masses next to warmer ocean currents. Neither of these currents should extend past large mountain ranges, um, and only a little bit, but this should help us with temperature and precipitation later on. All right, so now we're going to have another little lesson on upwelling and diodes. So to talk about upwelling, when you have currents that are going towards land and then they split going north and south, that isn't actually the extent of this effect because oceans are not 2D, they are 3D. And so not only does, once the water hits the coast, does it travel north and south, but some of the currents also travel down. These currents will travel deeper into the ocean as a process called downwelling. And the transverse is, if you have currents blowing away from a coast, you will have a bit of upwelling where those deeper ocean currents are rising up to the surface and joining the surface ocean circulation. We are not concerned with downwelling at all right now, but we are slightly concerned with upwelling. And the reason is, is that the ocean water, the deep ocean water that they are bringing up to the surface is going to be significantly colder than surface water. And they're gonna bring a few very important things with them mainly nutrients and the fish and the ecosystems that thrive on these. Now, areas of significant upwelling are going to have significant fishing rich areas, which will affect things like culture and the type of civilizations that can grow up there because they have easy access to food. All right, so now we're going to move on to dipoles and oscillation. And this is kind of getting into a little bit more complexity and I really want to talk about this, but I am, I'm controlling myself. I'm controlling myself. We are only going to talk about this just a little bit. Now, typically these diodes and oscillation of these major ocean circulation areas do not have an annual cycle to them or a seasonal cycle to them. Typically it is normal, normally these longer, you know, multi-year cycles that I mentioned earlier, but the caveat is that they do have a incredible impact on both climate, but also on the cultures and the civilizations of the people that would live there and, you know, weather in general. Before we get into what these diodes and what this oscillation actually is, let's talk about what happens in these areas. So this is basically going to be an oscillation right between two extremes, uh, precipitation and no precipitation. So you will have years, potentially, long periods of time of drought, of aridity, and then you will have years of tons of, you know, precipitation and water. And this is going to have a really big impact both on the ground because, you know, it affects the things that grow there, it affects the things that can hold onto the soil, and then having suddenly this onslaught of tons of precipitation has a big impact. It will impact food, the types of things people can grow. It'll impact the culture of people as they're constantly waiting for the switch and waiting through these yearly cycles of these extreme differences in precipitation levels. Now, two big examples of this on Earth that you've probably heard of would be the El Nino and La Nina cycle in the Pacific Ocean. 
and the Indian Ocean Dipole in the, you guessed it, the Indian Ocean. Now, we are only going to be focusing on the most extreme of these examples on the planet. There's a lot of nuance that can be found here. And in the blog post that's linked below, I do have some more references linked there that you can go to to look into it if you're just curious. But it really won't play a part anywhere here on our map right now. All right, so the areas that we're going to be looking at for these really strong cycles are going to be areas where you have really strong ocean surface currents that have strong that have strong surface winds. So this is mainly going to be your ITCZ and maybe a little bit of your westerlies. The oceans that you're going to be looking at for this too should, for the most part, be landlocked on both the east and the west and probably be landlocked on either the north or the south, depending on which side of the equator that you're on. Essentially what you're looking for is that these to be warmer waters and for there to be less water coming in on the surface from the Arctic. So I'm gonna draw this out for you sort of as I explain it, but there's gonna be two phases to this oscillation, this diode, right? You will have a positive phase and a negative phase. In a positive phase, your strong winds will blow the hot surface currents to the west where they will gather and cause downwelling, the only excuse of when we're gonna talk about downwelling, um, and create a very high pressure zone that is hotter and wetter than normal. On the eastern side, you will have upwelling to balance the downwelling, creating a colder than normal ocean with a low pressure zone that is drier and colder than normal. In a negative phase, the easterly ITCZ is going to weaken, and this causes that hot surface water to be blown towards the east where it, this causes that hot surface water to be blown to the east where it will gather causing downwelling and then it will cause upwelling on the west. And this is essentially the reverse conditions as a positive path. All right, so let's get on to mapping these. And we are going to map the diodes or the oscillation on our actual circulation maps as part of the ocean circulation, but we are gonna kind of indicate where they are so that when we get into later phases, namely the climate and the uh, global weather patterns where we can sort of take that into effect. All right, so looking at your ocean circulation map, we will mark areas that will have a large amount of upwelling and significant dipoles. So first, upwelling is gonna occur where wind currents, particularly strong ones, again, mainly your ITCZ and maybe your westerlies, um, but where these strong uh, wind currents are gonna be blowing water away from your coastlines. Look at where currents are flowing away from a continent around a major belt. You will have some amount of upwelling here regardless, but more if there isn't a direct way for surface currents to replace the water being blown away. So look at how the land is shaped. If you have a coastline shaped like a gulf with the water being blown away from the land, the upwelling is going to be significant because there is not a lot of place for water to come in and replace the surface currents that are, you know, coming from the north and the south. You're going to want to shade these areas with blue and you can see an example in some of the maps that I put in the uh... and I'll include a map here of some major upwelling systems on earth for examples. So two, as we've mentioned already exactly where and how dipoles and oscillations form is really complicated. In general, the oceans around each wind belt will have a diode or oscillation to some extent due to the strengthening and weakening of these winds. To focus on stronger dipoles that will have a higher impact on climates in a way that will affect world building, we will look at anywhere you have a large body of water that is landlocked on the east and west. These will be stronger if the ocean is also landlocked on the north or south as well, but particularly if it is cut off from the poles. Mark any of the oceans with strong diodes on your map with just a label of diode. So we are getting to the point now where we only have one more step with some sub steps before we get on to actually assigning climate regions, which is really exciting. So in the next part, we're going to be talking about temperature, precipitation and aridity. And then after that, in the next part, climate regions. If you're enjoying this world building series, I would love for you to post down below, talk about what you're working on, what you're finding on your maps, and share any excitement you have for going through this process because I'm a major nerd and I find it really freaking cool. But I hope this helped. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.